So in my last review where we had the Odin flashback and the betrayal and the rain hitting my red scabbards and their hopelessness and their despair and the impossibility of their situation and then here comes the Calvary, I really just had nothing negative to say. It was a, it was a complete gush. It was, that, that's all. It was a complete gush. This one will not be very different. I have enjoyed Watto so much. Um, again, I'll say it again, so much happened. I, in this video, I'm covering from where I left off with the betrayal all the way to chapter 1000. So I guess I should say I've officially surpassed the anime according to my patrons. So if you're an anime only watcher, spoilers beware, but it's such, it feels so monumental to have hit a thousand. It's so funny how, you know, I, again, I started the series, I started reading the series having no idea. I didn't know anything about it. All I knew was that there was one particular commenter that was pestering me to read it to the point that I was like, you know what, good effort, let's read it. But I didn't know anything. I didn't know the general plot line. I didn't know how much hype was around it. I didn't know how long it was until I started reading it and then someone messaged me and was like, you know that's over a thousand chapters long. And it's so funny to think about how big a thousand chapters feels. But then you get here and it's and it just feels like it'll go on forever, right? This is just a part of my life now. This is just what, this is the story that I read. And I don't want it to, it, feel, it feels so mon monumental to be here, but at the same time, I like to think there will be a thousand more, even though I know there probably won't. I like to think there will be, because it just, the story, the story is really sunk into me. Anyway, as I keep saying, because I'm covering a good chunk of stuff here, and because I physically and mentally can't sit down and film forever, um, I will be breezing past a couple things, skipping over a couple of things, really just discussing the parts that I loved the most. But I, as I also keep saying, Wano is for the first time, it's the first arc that has me genuinely excited to be caught up week to week because there's so much that happens in these chapters and there's so much that I love about it that I really am excited to discuss the story more in depth, to be able to cover just a, a lesser amount uh, whenever I do talk about it. So I do, I do have plans for what I'm going to do once I am caught up, uh, and that, and I will, I will have a video with those plans coming soon. It'll be its own dedicated video so that I don't have to keep saying it over and over again in videos. But anyway, let's talk about this. Oh my goodness. So Oda left me in the pits of despair with a big giant ray of hope. I was in, I was in all of my feelings and it was truly, the last section with Oda's flashback, with the betrayal, with the rain, with all the best. It was just the best. And I was excited to see what would happen next, but I also really didn't want to move on because I didn't want to move past the feelings that I was feeling and how perfect, how perfect that section was. But then I start reading and that's still my favorite part of Wano. This didn't surpass it, but I guess I should mention, this is going to be pretty much just a gush. And I, I, I do think that I'm tiny, I, I'm a tiny bit swayed by the fact that Oda is on a dinosaur kick with, with, um, Kaido's animal crew, with, with, with Kaido's people, they're all dinos. And I, like every child, love dinosaurs. So, uh, it has been so fun to have each dinosaur form revealed and to have so many dinos in this manga. It's been wonderful. But I do have one complaint. So like there's there's one nitpick that I have that kind of, that I'll, I'll complain about. But for the most part, it's all wonderful. Okay, let's focus. Pits of Despair, Ray of Light, Luffy and crew. And they come in and it felt so good to have the crew together again. I can't even remember the last time they were all together. I don't think it happened on Whole Cake Island. It's been so long. Has it been since Fishman Island? Has it been since Fishman Island? Was Were they all together during Punk House? It doesn't matter. I don't care. It's been so long. 
And having that, like, there was so much joy on their faces. You could tell how happy they were to be there and how happy they were to be moving forward and to be together. And I felt it, I felt it. It felt so good to have them together. Post time skip, they're just not all together very often. And I've enjoyed what Oda has done each time he split them up, but there's just something different when they're all together. And it felt so good with with the impact of it, with Luffy, in he just, I feel like he just, he holds the presence of a captain now more than ever. I mean, him standing in front of his crew on that ship, on the Sunny, uh, holding onto his hat in the rain with his new, with his new outfit. He just, he just, he has the presence of a captain here and I love it. Um, and then, and then Oda reminds us that really nothing has changed as they're trying to make their plans and uh, Foxfire turns out all of his plans were a mess and uh, what's his name? Do oh, shoot. I'm gonna have to ask. Dinjiro. Dinjiro uh, has so much faith in him and every mess up that kind of stumbles into success. Uh, he's just like, hey, great job. You planned this whole thing. And and Foxfire, <laughs> everybody else is like, admit you had no idea what you were doing. And I love, I love that coupled with uh, Law continually trying to command his own ship and all of the Red Scabbards just ignoring him, poor Law. Um, then Luffy and, oh, and Law understands, he finally understands the people that he's made an alliance with. He's no longer shocked by them. In fact, he's the one that says, listen, these idiots are gonna do whatever they want. They're gonna mess up any plan you make. And then, <laughs> and then whenever, whenever they send those idiots out, and they're, they realize, oh, we forgot to, we forgot to warn them about the guards. But they find the guards and it's all fine. They just destroy everything. It's so funny and it's so one piece. It's so, you know, we have we have this this all these emotions and then Oda brings everything back together and then makes it so typically one piece, but just on a different level. It's just different here. Having them all together and after all the impact and emotions that we've been we've just been through, the the humor that balances it all is just it feels nostalgic. It just it feels so good. And then the panel, after they took down the guards, after they actually knocked them all out and Zoro found the booze that he had been sniffing and everybody's just standing around and Jinbei's laughing, that panel of them all after they had, after they had taken down that guard area and they were entering and the whole crew was on that, two, that full spread, on that two-page spread, and they were all together just smiling and it just, it just, it feels different. It feels, Wano feels so good. I'm not even looking at my notes. I'm just going off. So let me look at my notes real quick. Oh, right. I absolutely love the dynamics between Law, Kid, and Luffy, especially here at the beginning of, of them all being together and how they are all fighting for the same goal, but they're bickering like children. Don't get in my way. I'm going to do it. I love these dynamics. You know, it's the Zoro Sanji thing, and it, 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 Oda does this with in many scenarios, and he did it whenever we first were introduced to Luffy and Kid fighting over who was going to carry the most stuff and get and get the most meal cards and I love that childish rivalry that Oda writes into the series all the time and it's it's so fun to me especially because these are all characters that I know are going to work together and I know they're on the same team like we're we're going to have maybe it'll be a begrudging friendship kind of like with Luffy and Law where Luffy believes that they're friends and Law doesn't want to say that they're friends. I love seeing them all fight between seeing the worst, these three worst generation fighting. I love the the moves, the the way the way Oda drew them fighting when when the Straw Hats took down that tower, and then we have Nami and Usopp and Chopper just watching on the boat while they take down all the guards. I just the way Oda draws Wano. I feel like he loves being here as much as I do. Everything's so beautiful. Everything feels so thought out. I love the panel of of whenever he's going through and showing each straw hat fighting the guards. I love the one of Sanji who's just like smiling and it seems like his thoughts are somewhere else as he kicks the guy. I love it. 
All right, we get the Dinjiro, Dinjiro reveal, betrayal, uh, which we already knew who he was, but not everybody did. And, and so we, we get the reveal of his betrayal, but for us on our side, uh, it, was, it was a very happy betrayal, him showing them that not only is he actually one of the Red Scabbards and he's remained loyal to Odin all this time, and that he was the one that, that raised Odin's daughter up, and, and actually all of our troops that we thought were, had met a demise, or who knows, he actually had them all, plus he was bringing his own men, and it was just, oh, just so much celebration after so much despair. We also got some really amazing moments with Momo in this section, um, specifically painter guy, hang on, Kinjuro, specifically uh, him bringing Momo to uh, Kaido and and the, you know, um, Orochi wants to crucify him in front of the crowds of people to, pr I guess, prove that uh, no one can stop him and there is no hope as he, he loves sending that message. Um, and, and the challenges that, that Momo has to face against the, the verbal challenges that he has to stand up against, I think are such great moments for Momo. Um, this line, your parents delayed their deaths for 20 years, but all those samurai follow is a wailing child. And he said, I know most of all that I am not Odin. I know better than anyone then him telling the Straw Hats not to chase him and that he'll find his own way out, then Luffy telling him, find a way to survive and we'll get to you because we're friends. And I just, there's so many great moments for so many people in this, I just, I love it. Uh, I, I kind of just, I, I kind of just skipped over Jinbei's uh, re-entry into the crew because I was so excited and just went on a rampage. But his re-entry, when I, I didn't even see him yet. I just saw, you know, the close-up of, of his features that Oda loves to do before he fully brings someone into the story. And I burst into tears. I was so happy. I've been wondering where he was, why he hasn't joined us back yet. I love his character so much. I loved Law and Kid's reactions when they saw that Luffy has a warlord, a former warlord in his crew. And <laughs> their reaction of just like, you've gotta be kidding. <laughs> How did he get him? And I feel you. I feel you. I don't think we deserve him, but I'm so happy that he wants to be a part of the crew. Anyway, now I've kind of caught up to myself from when I just ran. Um, now let's talk about Queen. <laughs> Because, so I don't watch the anime, but uh, one of my patrons, Jack, you're amazing, um, will will provide little clips of really significant moments in the anime so I can see it play out, which I really, really appreciate. And I can watch those after I read the chapters. Uh, but specifically for this, for this scene, for this episode, they really wanted me to watch the episode, Queen's episode, when he's throwing the party. And so we we all got on Discord and watched it together. And oh my goodness, I want to make zoom, zoom, zoom my ringtone. I love Queen. I loved him before I saw him in the anime, but I love Queen. He's a dinosaur, so it's easy to love him. I know he's evil, I know he's evil, but he's so funky and he's so cool and that that sequence in the anime was perfect. We actually watched the party scene twice because it was just it was so, so good. We get the reveal of the Tori Ropo, which, uh, okay, let's talk about them a little bit. So Uli, is that her name? Ulti. Ulti and Pepe are my favorites so far of of the uh, to, to, Tori Ropo. Oh man. Okay, Uli, U Ulti, and and Pepe. I love them. Ulti is such. Am I saying her name right? Ulti. Here's hoping. She's such a wild card. She, I love her trying to be classy and trying to be proper, and 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 yet she has this visceral 
angry uh, uh, side that it seems like she tries to tamper down, but then whenever she's irritated, she just like brings out the claws. She just lashes out. The fact that she's Apache Cephalosaurus <laughs> fits her personality so perfectly. I love how much Oda really, really thought about what kind of dinosaur he wants to make each person and how they fit their personalities. And as soon as she was revealed as the thick skulled head butting dino, it's like, of course she is. Of course she is. Plus her relationship with Pepe. I love Pepe, how, how she is so defensive over him. She will yell at him and she will beat him up and she will go off on him. But if he's in danger or if someone insults him or if someone looks at him funny, then she will turn on them. <laughs> <laughs> and his irritation with her and him just wanting her to leave him alone. Their dynamics are perfect. Absolutely perfect. I'll also, um, I'll also talk too early about something else because I'm a mess. And I'll talk about Black Moria because, no, not Moria. Maria. Black Maria because she is gorgeous. So I like her on the panel. But also, you know, what does she do? Until she's a spider. And that's why she's so big because of her giant spider torso. I love it. And that panel when she's first introduced, when her first uh, devil fruit is introduced and it turns out that she's hanging from the ceiling. It's so ominous. It's so terrifying. I kind of hate that Oda made the dino... The, I mean, it isn't... It it's, it's a prehistoric spider, made the spider so palatable by making it goofy. I kind of hate that. And I understand he probably did it to uh, make it possible for people who have arachnophobia to read. I mean, I don't know. I'm making an assumption here. I assume that's why he did this, but I don't want it. I want her spider form to be full on terrifying. Obviously, I've always loved Drake because he's always been a dinosaur. The two, um, Who's Who and Sa Sasaki, I don't care. I They have provided me with very little to care about them until uh, Sasaki turned into a Triceratops, which is one of my favorite dinos. It was so, ah, uh, that reveal felt so good. And again, I barely know his personality, but it sure does fit his character design. <sighs> I still don't care about who's who, but ah, guys, this is just, so fun. I'm having so much fun. Oh yeah, and then as they were partying, you know, they dumped out the food and uh, all in front of Luffy, which this time Luffy's triggered by this instead of Sanji. And I really love, um, you know, they all got that outfit change, which is fine. Um, Robin and Jinbei look awesome. And I love their dynamics throughout this entire section. I love their dynamics, period. Anytime those two are together, the the, the true intellects of the crew, the, the, the most wisdom and probably the most mature, the most wisdom, the most wisdom filled and probably the most mature members of the crew, anytime they get together, it's just wonderful. And am I crazy or does Oda ship them? I feel like Oda ships them. But anyway, Luffy is supposed to go in stealth mode, but instead he's in Luffy mode because of the food getting spilled out. And then Zoro, who <laughs> doesn't Zoro come? Oh my golly. Doesn't Zoro come specifically because he doesn't want Luffy to get lost, which is like the biggest joke. But Law and, not Law, Kid and Killer, which I'm just, I'm so pleased. I'm so pleased with how it's been, it's very, it's a very small detail. It's not it's something that takes a lot of forefront um, in all the chaos that's happening. But I'm so pleased at how Kid and his crew uh, treat Killer. The fact that he's still Kid's number two and he's still uh, a part of the crew. Everybody, as soon as they rescued him, everybody was just like, yep, you're here. Nothing has changed except now we have a... a, a, a grudge against Kaido because of what you've done to our friend. But like the fact that he laughs all the time, the fact that he can't swim anymore, the fact that he, all of the things that that have affected Killer, that have ruined Killer, they don't care. He's still a part of their crew. And it's such a small detail, but also I feel like 
it's so in line with the themes of One Piece, of this found family and of um, of, of friendship and loyalty and 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 really just it 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 fits the themes of of One Piece so well. But then I also feel like it reflects on this crew so well. Anyway, having these four, the two uh, Luffy and Kid, and then both of their number twos, uh, having them all in this chaos and having them team up together was wonderful because of how much they were snapping at each other and bickering throughout the whole thing. Killer thinking that they're all just idiots. Um, whenever Luffy, I'm still all over the place. I get, I'm too excited. Whenever Luffy sees everything, sees the food get dumped and he says, where, did I write down the line? I'm not sure I wrote down the line, but the line was something along the lines of whenever, whenever Luffy said, why are you wasting food when Thomas' stomach is still hungry? And and then whenever, whenever Zoro comes in and he's like, what's going on here? And Luffy says, they spilled the food. And both, you have that panel of both Luffy and Zoro and then Tama, both the flashback they, that, they, that, they, that they share of Tama. And, and the fact that both of them just, they don't need to communicate it. They just both get it. They get why this is unacceptable. Zoro is really cool in this section. Everybody's so cool. Anyway, they fight off against Oppo, the music guy, which um, honestly, he's my least favorite of the worst generation. I don't get it. Maybe because I'm not a musician, so there's probably some subtleties about how Oda is incorporating the instruments and why one instrument is doing something that another instrument. There's probably a lot that Oda's putting into this that's just going straight over my head. I don't care for his design. I There's... He just, he doesn't hit me right. That said, I do love the fight because um, it's such an unexpected fighting style and it feels so overpowered and feels so like, okay, hang on, our crew shouldn't be like, Luffy shouldn't be carried out this early on in everything that we're about to go through. Uh, but then such a simple like, okay, if we can't hear him, he can't affect us, which is such a huge, massive weakness, but you have to figure it out in order to get there. And then of course, we got so many incredible panels of Zoro in this fight of him when he's fighting him and when he's taking him down. Oh! I love Zoro. I love the way Oda draws Oro Zoro when he's fighting. I love, I think that, I think that he is some of the best fight panels uh, just because of how cool he looks. I mean, everybody has great back panels, but I just really, really liked this. We also got the reveal that he was already an informant of Kaido and basically the reason we're doing all this, the reason Killer uh, was captured and forced to eat the smile fruit and the reason Kid was captured and the reason this is, there's a lot of this mess is attributed to Oppo being an informant and being a backstabber. So much betrayal happening in this arc and I love it. Um, I also am so happy that Marco is here. I'm so happy to see Marco again. I gotta admit, I didn't see it coming. There was probably some foreshadowing. There were probably some reasons for me to have seen it coming. I didn't, I didn't catch it. I did not expect him to just show up and he did and and it was so funny to see him you know big mom's crew is still trying to get up the waterfall and the first time king slapped them down out of the air and this time marco so easily just slaps them down again i mean he kicks them down but you know i have many many questions surrounding this i want to know uh what's up with pop's village who's protecting it now is it still safe? What's going on with Whitebeard's son? That was, I'm pretty sure he was the threat to Pop's village before, right? That's why Marco was there. Am I misremembering? I should go back and reread that section to be sure that I'm remembering correctly. But what's going on with Whitebeard's alleged son? Uh, what's going on with the village? Who's protecting it now? What made Marco decide? What was he, what, what did he do to prepare, I guess there's other members of Whitebeard's crew still there. I'm sure they can handle it. What did he do to prepare to be able to leave? What did he need to do before he could come? And and what's going on in that whole situation there? Also, I'm really curious what Oda's gonna do going forward with, um, with Mom's crew because it doesn't work for me for Big Mom to have tried to get here so that she could take down Luffy, so that she could 
I don't know if her initial plan was, it was. She said she wanted to form an alliance from the start and Kaido said no. Okay. So her plan was to get here to kill Luffy and to team up with Kaido, right? So she tried to, then she got knocked out of the air and got amnesia and then she, through a series of events, got her got her memories back and is and is back with Kaido and now they formed an alliance. I don't love the way it happened, but whatever. But now her crew is still, her kids are still not up here. And it doesn't work for me for these two emperors of the sea to team up and to have to continually cut back to her kids trying to get up the waterfall and continually just getting slapped back down. And like they, that just is what happens. And then we have the whole fight and 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 whatever happens in the fight happens in the fight and Big Bomb's crew just isn't in the fight. I just don't think that that's what can work. Otherwise, it feels useless to have brought the kids. It feels useless that we just keep cutting back to them, trying to get up the waterfall and failing and trying to get up the waterfall and failing. They're going to get up the waterfall eventually or they're going to, something's going to, some way they're going to get here because it doesn't work for them to just to just continue to get foiled and then that's their whole purpose in this arc. So I wonder how they're gonna get up the waterfall. I wonder why they've been delayed so much. Is it just a convenience thing? They just keep getting delayed repeatedly by bird creatures, by bird people because we need to get the crew to them and that would be too much resistance. I don't know. I don't know what's going on here, but I think that they have to join the fight eventually. Maybe they'll join the fight late. Maybe it'll look like we're about to win. It'll look like we're overpowering everybody. And then Big Mom's people show up. And then it's like, oh no, we can't go on because we're already so beaten down. Um, and it'll be like a here comes the cavalry for the bad guys. But then uh, Katakuri is going to turn on them and fight with us and be a part of our crew. I mean, he's not going to be a part of our crew, but I don't know. I still, I still hold out hope that there are certain members of mom's crew, of mom's children, that are not pleased with her and feel trapped. And I like to think some of them are going to turn. I like to think, okay, here's my prediction. I'm almost never right. That... They're going to, they're going to make it up, but they're going to make it up late. And it's going to look hopeless, but then some of them are going to turn and fight with us. That's what I say. Oh, we also got to see what Marco's note was, which is, I might be late, but I'll be here. And you know, I just really like it. I don't really have much to say about it. I just really like it. I just really, really like it. We did have the shenanigans with Big Mom. Uh, she finally finished getting dressed and she comes out and she sees Chopper and Usopp in the, in the tank and she's like towering over the tank and then, you know, all that, uh, which I'm kind of just gonna breeze past because it was enjoyable, but I don't really have a lot to say about it. And instead I'm just gonna skip straight to Doily Chick, Ulti, Ulti, and her fight with some of the crew. First off, her uh, going head to head with Luffy, I love. And then I guess I'll just skip ahead and also talk with, talk about her against Usopp and Nami. Is it fine if I just skip ahead and talk about them a little bit? Yeah, I'm just gonna talk about it all together because here's the thing, I love it. I love Ulti, I love that this is her big fight thing. I love that, Us that, that Luffy just comes against it so well. Um, I love her fighting against this really, really powerful creature and person fighting against Usopp and Nami, who are the runners of the crew. Nami has this incredible weather baton. Uh, when she fights, it's, I love, I love her fight panels. Um, but seeing them get beat down, I mean, beat down. And then Usopp, uh, begging her in his mind, just lie, just lie. It doesn't matter. And, and I know that we've seen each crew member proclaim that Luffy will be the Pirate King. And, and, you know, we were waiting on Nami's. Um, but this one, I don't know, this one kind of hit me different, even though each one I, f I feel has been really, really good. But hers hit me different because I really, I really think that she thought she was gonna die. Like, she knew I could, I could lie and I could survive or I could not deny my captain and, and die. And the fact that her 
saying that he will not stop until he is king of the pirates while she's crying, while she's, while she's being held by someone who's about to kill her. And, and I don't know, it, did it remind everybody else of the same thing? Maybe Oda did this really intentionally, but did it remind everybody else of her mom when her mom could have easily just denied her kids? Like it's really, it would have been so easy, but she refused to let them hear her deny them. So she took her death instead. And even though, even though Luffy wasn't in the room and he wouldn't have heard it, her refusing to deny his dream, even, even though it wouldn't have meant anything, it wouldn't have mattered at all, her loyalty, loyalty to him being so strong, I don't know. This one just felt different. Not necessarily better, just different. And I quite liked it. Oh, right, and I feel like I would be remiss to talk about all this without mentioning uh, Tama, who is here with some of her beasts, and <laughs> I have so many questions about her. I'm, I'm happy she's here, but also I'm a little bit worried about her, but also if she's here, probably something massive is about to happen with her powers. You know, she's still, uh, the fact that she still has the beast that she tamed way back at the beginning of Wano, and they're so loyal to her, means that her face cheeks are very, very powerful and have long-lasting effects, and I just wonder what we're gonna do with her. I mean, she's obviously really significant, so she could potentially tame any of Kaido's beast pirates. So we have an endless amount of possibility with Tama being here. Now, I feel like she could, as a, as a little girl who doesn't fight, she could easily be squashed. We're obviously not gonna do that. So what are we gonna do instead? I don't know, who's she gonna tame? She has to tame some of the beast pirates. It has to happen. It's too perfectly set up. Who? I don't know. When? I don't know. What will it do? To what effect will it have in the tides of this fight? I don't know, but I'm keeping my eye on her and I'm happy she's here. Anyway, jumping back to where I'm supposed to be as we're talking about this stuff, Yamato is here. We met Yamato and oh my goodness, uh, so many things. Yamato has Odin's journal, which means so along with it so much information that I don't have and would like to, I mean, I understand that I got the flashback, which is probably a large part of the journal, but there's gotta be more information there than what I have and I'd like to have it. Also, a connection with Ace. I love how present Ace is in this arc. I, why was he here before? I mean, I know a little bit, but why was he here before? How much impact did he truly have? I love the fact that everybody that encounters him seems to want to, seems to have a very strong connection with him and he left such a big impact on everybody. Also, um, Yamato has the chains, the same, the same stuff that we keep seeing over and over again where uh, they will blow up if we leave the island. So really quite trapped. And the heir of Kaido wants to join our side and fight alongside us. Yes, please. So cool. This whole section is just riddled with so many fights. So again, I'm gonna breeze past some things, but one that I really loved was when, dang, I'm gonna forget his name again, hang on. Kanjuro, the painty betrayal guy, meets our red scabbards at the gate and won't let them in, and they fight. Oh man, I think, I think part of the reason why this has such impact on me is because of who he is, is because he's one of the red scabbards. And we already knew about the betrayal, we already knew about all this stuff, but now having him actually stand against them in this way, with his own army behind him when he once stood with them, it just, it feels so heavy. But then you also have our, 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 our crew looking so cool. They're not our crew, they're our red scabbards. Looking so cool as they face off against him between Kiku with the awesome armor and uh, uh, 
Cat Viper and Dog Storm looking so cool with their upgrades and laughing and smiling as they show each other uh, <laughs> how they've been upgraded with the with the uh, the foot and the in the hand. Also, another really significant scene was when Kaido actually announces the alliance between him and Big Mom and announces that they're going after the One Piece and then just cuts off Orochi's head, just as if he put no thought into it, as if it doesn't matter, as if, as if this man hasn't been so wholly hated by me that he's taken up so much of my headspace and so many of my emotions and then just out of the way. I mean, Re it's so, Kaido's such a fascinating character to me because he's propped Orochi up for so long and, and, and invested so much in him and had this alliance with him for so long and that he would so quickly just discard him in such a public and callous way, which I'm not mad about. I'm thrilled that he's dead, but having that and then not that many chapters later, you have him, uh, like when Jack is taken down and Kaido steps in and says that's enough and he doesn't want, he doesn't want his people to have this kind of harm to them. It's so, it's so interesting to see this level of, of, of empathy and care for his people, yet also this callousness toward anyone that he doesn't deem worthy, including someone that has been on his side for so long. He's such a fascinating character to me. And every, I feel like every time I get a scene with Kaido in it, I watch his facial expressions and I listen to his words. I see him giving Odin the chance to, uh, to survive the boiling, despite giving such a terrible sentence, still saying, okay, yeah, try it. And, and I don't know, he just, he's a character that I would love to get to know a little bit better. <laughs> Plus his design is so cool. Whether he's a man or a dragon, he takes, he dominates every panel he's in. I love to look at him. He is drawn so awesomely. He's evil and I he should be taken down, but also I love every panel he's in. I also, uh, cutting back to Momo when he's, when he's on the crucifixion thingy and he's been beaten and he's been mocked and he's had so much happen to him up to this point. Uh, the moment where he got to shout out, I am, uh, how do I say his name? Kazuki Momonuski? Momonuski. I've never actually tried to say his whole name. When he says that, and he says, the man who will be Shogun of Wano. Oh. You know, it's his I'm gonna be the Pirate King moment, and it's, I just feel like he's come so far for fighting for his people and for still having fear, plenty of fear. I mean, he's a child that's been brutalized at this point. No one would blame him for quitting. But the fact that this is where he stands up and he says, I will not back down. Oh man, I've been waiting for moments like this with him and they're just as satisfying as I thought they'd be. Also the scene of Sanji when he, when he gets Momo and, and takes him away. And what does he say? It's something along the lines of like, just, Good job, man. Like he's just, he's just really hyping up our boy after he's been through so much. I thought that was a really sweet scene. Also the fight, again, I gotta talk about Ulti again because everything she does is phenomenal, but the fight between her and Yamato was, again, a great fight. I love Ulti's fighting way, but it was also great just because of like every fight, it was also riddled with so much humor. But <laughs> when when uh, Yamato is saying, I'm Odin over and over again and confusing everyone. And then Ulti just stops and says, I have no idea what you're talking about. Are you crazy? Oh no, she, I have it right here. She said, are you crazy or stupid? <laughs> Speaking of this whole section being riddled with fights and me not being able to acknowledge all of them. One thing that I have to spend some time acknowledging is once again, 
Kaido looks so cool when he's in his dragon form and he's all coiled up and then he like stretches up and he's like hovering over everything. Oh my gosh. But then that panel, do you know what I'm talking about? Where he's, where he's outstretched and, and, and this dominating form, but then on the sides you have all the Sulong charging. Oh, I love, I love the Sulong form. I imagine that's not, is anybody surprised? Do, do, do we all? I love, it's so satisfying to see every time someone transforms, whether it's gonna be like Cat Viper and Dogstorm, where they're these big, giant, awesome looking beasts, or where it's like Carrot and the other chick, cause, I don't remember. And they're like these gorgeous forms, which by the way, in my video where I was picking out my pirate crew, I really did care it a disservice. I mean, I, I didn't see any comments of anybody mad at me about it, but I'm mad at me about it because I kind of just, I mentioned her and then moved on and I take it back. I want Carrot on my team because she's powerful and she's gorgeous and I'd like her to be on my crew. And plus, let's be real, a member of the Revolutionary Army is not gonna join my crew. Oh, oh, I found my note about Sanji. When he grabs Momo and takes him away and he says, way to drop your name like that little man. Not only is he hyping up Momo after he's been through so much, which I just think is a really sweet moment, but also this is Sanji in his transformed state. He's using his dad's equipment to be, what was he called? Sobo man or something? To, to be in his, in his other form, which is something that he's ashamed of. It's something that he doesn't like. He's ashamed of his name. He doesn't want his family name. And in this garb, he turns to Momo and says, way to drop your name. I don't know. There's something about the way Oda chose that verbiage in this state that I think just, it, it, it just, it means a lot coming from Sanji, I think. Uh, there's a lot of humor that goes on around the straw hats as well that have kind of uh, grazed past, but Frankie and, uh, and, and Brooke have been hilarious in, in this little section so far between Frankie wanting someone to, uh, ride with him and Brooke <laughs> takes the offer even though Frankie was looking for a chick to to be on his on his motorcycle thingy with him but Brooke's just like it's gonna be me and uh and then whenever whenever Frankie says oops did I just run over something and it's big mom's face he just ran over an emperor of the sea and he's so casual about it. And then whenever the two of them are facing off against the Emperor of the Sea, they both shamelessly flirt with her. What did they say? I'm pretty sure I wrote it down. Yep, when Frankie is looking at the Emperor of the Sea and he says, you like my metal bod, Grandma? <laughs> and then, and then um, I don't remember who it was that, that was trying to get them to run away and not face off an emperor of the sea. And Frankie says, running away from the emperor of the sea, do you want to make our captain the pirate king or not? Oh. And we know that Frankie and Brooke, as awesome as they are, cannot win against her. But incoming Jimbe to just grab her arm and twist her backwards and oh my goodness. Uh, whenever she says, whenever she tells Jimbe that she's gonna kill him and his response is, is simple, I, I welcome the attempt. Every line, every line from that man is amazing. He's just, he's constantly, he's so suave and proper and polite, but so bold and ah. Oh! They're all together again, and this pose of them all when they all finally got on the roof and they're all standing there and their iconic poses and they look so cool and Frankie is this giant robot thing and everybody, I'm just, it's just, I know I need to take it down a notch. I know I'm being ridiculous, but <sighs> Wano is really good and I'm so hyped about everything that's happening. I love the dinosaurs. I love how much time we're getting with our crew together. I love how hilarious it is. I love how emotionally intense it is. I I love the little moments that we get uh, where, I mean, I've always loved how Oda levels them up and how it 
it feels so organic. Like, um, they're in a fight and they learn a skill, they push themselves harder and they get somewhere because of a fight. And then the next time they have this ability and like Luffy being able to see into the future a little bit. And, and we can easily look back and say, I know what caused that. I know how we got here. And with this moment of them, of them looking at these, these monsters and saying, oh, you remember when we fought Oris together? And it was something that nearly killed them all. They all nearly died. In fact, some of them kind of sort of did die whenever the sun came out and their shadows and then the ones that they had their shadows removed and then they disappeared a little bit, but then they got it back. And I still am kind of mad that Oda didn't write consequences into that. Like they kind of sort of died. There should have been, why, why, why are there no after effects to that? But fine. Anyway. I love them looking back at that and just smiling and just being like, oh yeah, remember when we almost died fighting this guy? Let's go take these ones down. And it's just like that little, little moment to me shows so well how far they've come, how much stronger they are, how, how something that looked impossible to them and that they were ready to die for and really thought that they would die for if Luffy couldn't overcome it, um, that now they just kind of are like, huh, remember back then? Okay, let's go take care of this. Ah! Um, there is this, this line where Hawkins says that there's 1% chance of, um, of survival for someone. We don't know who. Now he was, this was, a lot of times when Oda drops something like this, he kind of foreshadows, like he uses that dropping as a foreshadow. So whoever we were just talking to, whoever we were just looking at, a lot of times that's who it was. Like that's how we had the reveal of Momo's sister. So the obvious answer is Drake. Is he gonna die in this? But that feels too easy. Uh, the same with Queen when he says that he's going to dethrone, or I don't remember how he put it, one of the Tony Ropa <laughs> whatever it's called. Um, the obvious answer is Drake because Drake betrays them and he's now in an alliance with us, which I haven't even talked about. Should we talk about that? Did I just skip over that? No, it's happening right now. This is, this is, this is, okay, it's fine. The obvious answer is Drake for what Queen said and for what Hawkins said, but I don't think that Oda's gonna go that obvious for either of these. Um, I don't know who Queen is planning on taking out of this group of people, but I really hope that it's Pei Pei because Ulti is such a loose cannon whenever he has been harmed or insulted or when anything, his toe has been stepped on, she loses her mind. And if he lost his position of honor and power, and I don't really understand all of the dynamics of this, if he lost that position, Ulti would lose her mind. And I would just love to see it. I don't know who's gonna lose this position, but I hope it's him just for the reaction of his sister. Uh, and as far as Hawkins' prediction of 1%, you know, the obvious answers are Drake and Kaido. Um, I don't know. I guess I don't have a prediction for this either. I kind of, I, I kind of think it might be Hawkins. I guess he could have been talking about Oppo. I don't know who he's talking about, but I am making notes that these things have happened. Anyway, Drake defects. He, which we already knew that he was in alliance with the Navy because of the conversation he had with Kobe whenever we first got the reveal that the, Warlord positions have been dismantled, blah, blah, blah. So, we already knew this. Hello? Sorry, that was an important call and it threw off my groove. Drake has defected. We already knew that he was not, we, he wants to join our crew, not that. He wants to help us. And I'm thrilled about it because I like Drake because dinosaur, but um, the crew is not so sure and Luffy is, about as happy about it as I am. I really love the uh, the the panel where the crew is, I'm so distracted now. I really love the panel where the crew is saying, absolutely not, not gonna happen, never in a million years. And then Luffy says, sure, he can join our, our side. And, and they turn and they're like, no, he can't. Shut up, captain, you moron. Um, how he is the leader and they will follow his, what he says, but they will not refrain from screaming at him 
whenever he makes a call. So we're gonna fight against Kaido and gosh, this is another one. I think I may have skipped past, I did, I skipped pa past a lot of things. Like uh, there's this giant that we're facing off against that Frankie got some really good fights in with that Jinbei helped out with. There was a great scene where uh, Sanji was helping Luffy and then Jinbei walked in and Sanji was like, I'm helping him. And Jinbei's like, so sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. And again, just Jinbei's whole vibe is ma amazing. There's a lot of things that I kind of just breezed right past, um, but there's so much happening that it's really hard not to breeze past those things to get to these incredible things like this, like Kaido versus the Red Scabbards. And the way Oda drew that one panel of Kaido sweeping in and and then the, the other panel underneath it of the scabbards lined up poised to fight as well and and the way those panels kind of intersect and oh my golly the way Oda drew everything in Wano the 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 before they even started charging each other whenever Kaido uh blew his dragon flames at them and 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 Foxfire split the flames down the middle um in this fight we see Cat Viper and Dog Storm so long forms we see um Razo with his scroll abilities where he captured the flame and bounced it back at him or rather wrapped it around him and how much that affected him. You have all of the red scabbards lined up in, in Odin two sword style, which is just so amazingly drawn. And then they all come in and they slice him and they try to cut open the old wound that Odin himself cut. It, there's, the fights are cool. They're cool but it's the symbolism that goes along with them. It's the way Oda draws it. It's not just the fact that they're fighting. It's not just the fact that we have the Red Scabbards against Kaido and boom, action, pow. It's the way he draws it. It's the way he he makes those panels and, 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 the, and, and the way the Red Scabbards aren't just fighting him, but they're fighting him in Odin's old style, which is such an honor to him, the way that he is still their leader and they still pay him so much love and honor and they're still his loyal scabbards despite the fact that he's been dead for so long. It's n and the fact that they don't just try to cut into Kaido but that they try to cut the spot that Odin cut. It's, it's not just the fact that it's a really cool fight, it's the way Oda makes the fight filled with symbolism and filled with with the with the way the scabbards feel about their leader and and ah, I can't put it into words. I can't do it. I can't do it. But I've said it many times. I like the way Oda does the fights, but I don't read this story for fights. I read it for the characters, I read it for for the themes, I read it for the friendships. I read it I read it for the world, but not for the fights. But the reason that despite me really not caring that much about just long drawn out fights, despite that, it's the way Oda writes them, filled with so much emotion and filled with so much symbolism and filled with so much meaning. It makes me care about something that I normally wouldn't care that much about. We have the stuff with um, with the ninja chick, chick taking taking Momo and, and taking arrows for him and getting injured. And then Yamato, y y Yamato, y Yamato comes in as well. And all that was great, but I'm just gonna keep talking about the fight if that's fine. So then Kaido, we, we think we've done some real damage, but he stands up and he just mocks them. And then he, he, he uses those invisible slashes. He cuts off Kiku's arm. I mean, I don't know. I just, I feel like Oda is constantly reminding us how much of a monster Kaido really is and how much, how impossible our situation really is, like how undefeatable he is, which just makes this this whole thing feel, I don't know, I, I feel so much suspense. You know, I openly hate how much Oda fake out deaths us. Um, and I and I know that there's not a lot of death that happens in this series, 
And yet I feel so much tension because he can write a villain so impeccably and because there's a way to create stakes without having to kill someone every time. And he just, he does it. He does it so well. Anyway, Foxfire cauterizes Kiku's uh, decapitated arm. Decapit? It's fine. He cauterizes it with his bloody and dirty sword that he's been using to battle. I feel like that's not super helpful, but it's okay. And then Kiku is just like, sweet, instead of, instead of, you know, continuing to say, ow. Um, in the meantime, while all this is going on, which I think I said earlier that the Straw Hats were on the roof. I got my plot mixed up. They're definitely not on the roof yet. I'm a dum-dum. But anyway, the Straw Hats uh, are now... Queen has started to unleash this uh, freezing plague. And again, it's so, um, like Queen is so cool, <laughs> but he's also really one of the most evil people here. Um, Kaido and Orochi definitely won, but Queen might be number three. Uh, he, his, the way he, when, when they, we were at, in the prison and he was unleashing his plague and he was like, doesn't matter if I hit you. I just have to hit someone near you and they'll touch you. And his lack of care for life and his ruthlessness and, and how disgusting the things that he's doing to these people are, it really is terrible. But this is my one complaint. Are you ready for my one, my one whinge? I'm gonna, I'm gonna nitpick. The thing is, the thing is, I love Oda. And I love him as a writer, but there are times where I feel that he creates these devastating situations and then the way he then is just like, and now it's over. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy, we figured it out. Sometimes it's almost comical and this is a comical series, but it's comical in the wrong way where it's just like, okay, Oda. You know, like this one felt that way to me where it was like, this plague is coming and destroying people and, and it's and it's terrible and no, oh no, now Chopper is infected. What are we gonna do? Feels like an impossible situation. What could happen next? Well, I happen to have this antidote that's the only antidote in the whole wide world for this thing and I'm not, I'm not hiding it. In fact, I'm flashing it around for everyone to see. Uh-oh, you're chasing me now? Oh no, wait, Chopper figured it out super easily, really, really fast with no effort whatsoever? and somehow nobody died, again. And I, sometimes, sometimes these things feel a little bit too, it's like it takes away the impact of what's really happening and the suffering that's going on and kind of like this moment of how could we possibly get out of this and that it's so quickly met with such a simple and easy and a bit silly uh, solution that it's just like, all right. So that's my nitpick. That's my one nitpick. I thought that this was a bit, I, th I thought that this scene could have been a lot more impactful and it's kind of unfortunate because Chopper is actually amazing in this scene. Chopper is a character that is a background character more often than not and that frankly I forget is in the room half the time. And him in doctor mode, him in compassion mode, him looking at a situation and solving that problem and doing everything in his power, sacrificing everything he can, putting himself in danger to help people to his last breath. This is one of the best things about Chopper and what I love to see on display. And this was a moment for Chopper that was actually really, really great, but I felt got undermined by the nonsense of, here's the antidote, I'm not trying to hide it. Oh, better run. It just, it all felt too, it's either don't do it or give it some more time and, and fully do it. But it felt so rushed that it kind of swept the legs under, out from underneath Chopper, in my opinion, which is unfortunate because I really like when he's able to shine. Oh, so uh, the Marco versus mom moment was, or Marco and mom chatting moment was really good, but I'm actually just going to breeze past it so I can talk about, um, carrot because I love that she knows who killed Pedro and that she is on a mission to take him down. I really like that a lot because her loyalty to the Straw Hats is great and 
she has been, I've enjoyed her presence, but uh, seeing her have her very own motivation and seeing that, that rage fueled within her of someone that she cared about, one of her people were so unjustly taken down and that now she has such a strong purpose of, I will finish this. And, and I hate this character, the tongue guy. I, I hate him and I wish he would go away. And she made him go away. <laughs> and it was, I loved it. I'm so pleased that she and the other chick whose name I can't remember, took him down. I'm pretty sure that they just like gave him some really nasty scars, but it was a great scene. Oh, another thing that I wanna mention uh, that Yamato said about Momo was that Momo was destined to guide us to the dawn of the world. And I double checked um, with my patrons and they helped me find that scene again. Um, but that's super similar to what Pedro said about Luffy. Um, the ones who will guide us to the dawn of the world. So what is the dawn of the world? I don't really know. I like to think that it is uh, what everybody has been hyping us up to, the new age, and when we finally are able to take the world government down and destroy the, to the toe jams and all that. Um, it could, I suppose, be something smaller scale, like, you know, finish helping uh, Wano. It could just be taking down Kaido and opening the gates, but I like to think it's bigger than that, which makes me think that maybe Momo is gonna be with us a little bit longer than I anticipated. I kind of thought whenever we were done in Wano, Momo would stay and be the Shogun. But now that he and the Straw Hats have both had the same thing said about them, I am I think that either means that Wano is the dawn of the world, whatever we're doing here, that's what that's in reference to, or Momo is gonna continue on with us for some reason. Oh, you know what? Yamato could be show. Oh, okay, prediction. Um, Whenever we're done in Wano, Momo is the obvious next Shogun, but he, for whatever reason, he's gonna realize that he needs to continue on with the Straw Hats and he's gonna continue sailing with us and Yamato is gonna stay and be the Shogun, which I'm not really thrilled about. I don't, I do like Momo, but I don't really like the idea of him not staying in Wano. I don't like the idea of him continuing past this arc, but I mean, if Oda does it, he'll probably do it well. I'm really not worried about it. So I guess, I don't know. I, it just seems like, it seems like, you know, that seems to indicate that he might still be moving forward with us after Wano is over. So Yamato might take on uh, Shogun, which, you know, does work. I do really love the scene too of Law when he finds the Poneglyph. Um, it's not a red one, shucks. But I do really like this scene as well for the same reason that I, that I really liked Carrot's scene when she hunts down the stupid tongue guy. Because, you know, up to this point, We've had so much of Law kind of following Luffy and, and, and doing what Luffy is doing. And it's nice to see him have that moment of quiet and of impact and of, you know what, Corazon? I'm ready to figure this out. I'm ready to see what is this thing that drew you to me? What is this thing that made you do what you did for me? I'm ready to figure out what it is. And honestly, I think he's gonna figure it out pretty soon here because if I'm remembering correctly, I'm pretty sure there were two non-red poneglyphs on Whole Cake, Whole Cake Island as well. And now we have this one. So that means we have at least three poneglyphs that we haven't actually read yet. We got the rubbings from Whole Cake Island, but we haven't read them. And we haven't read this one. I hope Law got a rubbing while he was there. Um, but I assume, have there been two on Wano already? Didn't Brooke say he found one? Brooke said he found one on Wano already. Maybe it was this one. Maybe Brooke and Law saw the same one. Correct me. I, I, I could be misremembering something. We have several poneglyphs to read. Once we finish this giant epic battle, I have a feeling we're all gonna sit down together and Robin is going to give us a lot of information. And I think that Law is about to learn a lot about himself and so are we. We're gonna learn a lot about the will of D2. I don't know that it's we're gonna get all the answers. We may get more questions than we get answers, but I do think that we're about to get a lot of information once this arc finishes. 
Kaido did, at, at one point during this whole battle, just pick up an entire island and move it. That was an amazing panel. But also, I, his powers, man. His powers. How did he even do that? How does he even have the ability to do this? He's so overpowered. But I just really loved that panel, so I had to mention it. Oh, right. So I do really love when, when Zoro is fighting and then he decides, you know, it'd be super nice if I could get up high and then Marco shows up. And I really, it, it's another tiny li little detail, but when Marco shows up and he's, and he's like, everybody's like, oh, Marco, hey, how's it going? And then, and then Zoro doesn't greet him, but Marco turns to Zoro and says, hey, Rwanda, or however you say his first name or last name. The fact that he gives Zoro a specific high, I don't know why that has stuck with me, but it has. And then the two of them flying around together, and I just, I really like them together. I don't know how much more we're gonna get of them together, but I really, really liked this scene. Oh, right, we did get that little flashback with Ace and Yamato and how quickly they became friends. And again, I just, I love that everybody he encounters, unless they're his enemy, instantly attaches himself to him. But I love his line here uh, when he's talking about the worst generation and he says, but the toughest one of all of them won't be setting sail for a few years yet, my little brother. Oh. And I also love in that flashback that we found out that uh, way back then, both Izzy, uh, not Izzy, Izzo. Izzo and Marco were saying that they love to help Ace uh, infiltrate Wano and take down Kaido. And even though Ace isn't here, and even though they weren't able to do it next to Ace, the fact that they're doing it next to Luffy, again, I don't know, just there's so much little things like this that's so intentional that takes these little things like, oh, hey, they always said they were gonna do that. Look, they're here now. But the fact that they couldn't do it with the brother that they said they would, but they're backing up Luffy, it means a lot. It, it hits me hard. We also got a little bit of information on Kaido's devil fruit. Uh, Mom said that she gave him the legendary fish um, devil fruit. And I think it's so interesting that in this, that that the way Oda chose to do this was, was to take that myth of the koi fish that try and try and try to get up the waterfall. And if they're able to finally do it, then the gods turn them into a dragon. And then that's like, Kaido got the koi fish uh, uh, devil fruit and turned into a like and and the way to get into Kaido's uh, the way to get into Wano is to go up the water like how cool is that how cool is that is so unnecessary to put that kind of care into something like this and yet here we are I really love that Yamato let Momo read Odin's journal. I also love that Oda is once again emphasizing that, which I didn't mention in the last review, thank you for making sure that I saw it, that uh, Luffy and Roger both said the same thing, and it clearly isn't, I want to be the Pirate King. They said the same thing, they had the same reactions from their crew when they said it. I don't have any theories for you. I don't know what they could have said. I, I really don't have any theories. I don't know what it is. Uh, but I am very curious. Um, but this last chapter here, chapter 1000, I knew that Oda would save something really incredible for chapter 1000. And he did not disappoint me. Um, them being on the rooftop, Kaido and, and, uh, Kaido and Big Mom talking about them going and getting the One Piece, talking as if they've already won the fight. Um, come here. That they need to save Rob. Oof. That they need to save Robin, um, not not kill her, because they need her if they're gonna get to the One Piece. And then whenever Luffy and Zoro and Kid and um, uh, Killer, when they're all lined up, ready to face off against them, and Kaido mocks Luffy. And, and and so does Big Mom. The fact that they both, they try to they try to get in his head. They try to mock him. They try to belittle him. And the fact that Luffy doesn't even acknowledge them. It's like he can't even hear them because he sees the red scabbards on the ground. He sees the damage that Kaido has done. He sees 
how defeated they are. And rather than acknowledging the two emperors of the sea that are standing in front of him, laughing at him, rather than even so much as looking at them, he just walks over to Foxfire and bends down and tends to him. And then whenever Kaido tries to just go ahead and end it, Luffy turns around and strikes and ends the chapter on his iconic call, his iconic line that he's going to be the king of the pirates, that he's going to take him down and be the king of the pirates. The scabbards on, the red scabbards on the ground, seeing how hard we've fought to get here, how much we've lost and sacrificed to get to this moment. The, the emperors of the sea standing before us, going ignored. And then Luffy's focus being on the people, always the people. Then ending it on the on on Luffy's declaration. It really hit hard. It was it was it was everything that I could have. It was more than I could have hoped for this chapter, honestly. I thought that the, for the Thousands chapter, we'd see a lot of action, we'd see a lot of cool stuff, but I should have known better. I should have known that the way Oda would do the, thou the Thousandth chapter is to show how much we've gone through to get here, how much pain, and then show Luffy fully focused on the people, and on his goal. And I really like that Oda chose to make the focus of this, of this moment on the themes and not on the action. It was perfect. I mean, it was really, this whole section has been so much fun, but also it's been, even though it, it doesn't compare to the last section as far as how emotional it is, it has been so emotional. So many really important things have happened here for our crew. And um, even though they really haven't been the forefront of Wano at all <laughs> lately, still what panels they got of them all being together or of them having really important moments like Nami's moment or like this moment with Luffy, they still, they, they like, they ring through me. Does that make sense? Anyway, I'm still not done with part three. I'm still not caught up, but I will be caught up really, really soon. And I'm, you know what? I'm excited to be able to finally theorize with you guys and chat with you guys and a lot more. And, um, and I love this series. I think that I, th I mean, Wano still has a ways to go. I don't know how much more it has to go, but it's not done yet. And, um, it's definitely, unless it's, unless Oda completely drops the ball, which I don't anticipate, I think it's going to be in my top arcs. I have loved it. Anyway, continue to chat with, with, with me more in the comments if you feel like it. I breeze past a lot of things, so feel free to discuss those things plenty. Um, I post videos every Tuesday and Friday. I'll see you again soon. Bye.